Thank you, uh, Senator Ort, for uh, sponsoring this event. It's really my honor to, uh, to be here. You can see my title at the top. Our interest is uh, in the topics that are on the next slide, and we'll get right to it. Uh, these are the, the areas I want to hit on today. Uh, I want to talk about annoyance, adverse health effects, um, the causal or cause-effect relationships between annoyance and uh, low-frequency noise, including infrasound, on uh, human health. I'll touch on relevant noise guidelines, although I know my, the subsequent speaker, uh, Rob Rand, will be talking more in detail about those. And finally, if we have time, I want to talk a little bit about, briefly, about some of my personal observations or my observations from taking, uh, doing personal interviews with people who live uh, near wind turbines. Uh, let me take you back to 2009. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, telling you a little bit about how I uh, was introduced to the topic in the area of wind turbines and specifically wind turbine noise. Uh, a colleague of mine, Rick James or Richard James, asked me to accompany him to, a, to visit a family in what I call the um, thumbnail of the Michigan thumb, the first wind turbine project in the state of Michigan. Uh, just to get my thoughts as an audiologist on what I thought might be going on because the family was leaving its home at night to sleep in a motel on nights when the wind turbines were fully operational. Uh, Rick stopped his van um, by the side of the road and asked me, uh, as when we first noticed the wind turbines in the distance, how far do you think those turbines are from, from us? And naively I said, maybe a mile and a half. Well, the odometer on the van said it was five miles, so that was my first introduction, just real, the realization of how really tall these structures are. Uh, this overexposed photo on the left is the home of the family who was leaving their home at night to sleep in a motel. Uh, the turbine uh, nearest the home was in the back of the property, and the photo on the right is a closer shot of, uh, uh, of the turbine, that particular turbine. There were about four or five, as I recall, turbines located within about 1,300 to 2,000 feet of the home. Um, I... Let me go back. I did not personally notice a lot of effects because we were only there a few hours during the day. Rick took some measurements at night, but uh, we, weren't staying, we didn't stay in the home overnight. Uh, I, I, I felt a little bit queasy out front, uh, uh, sorry, out in the backyard as I sat there for a couple of hours when the turbines did finally turn during that day. Uh, but I went home wondering, what is it about turbines that would cause a family to uh, leave their home and sleep in a motel. Um, so that was my first experience, this visitation uh, to that home in uh, Upper uh, uh, Michigan in the Thumb. Uh, I went home and I first thing I did was read a book, uh, a fairly positive book on wind turbines uh, by Paul Guype. Um, I started, that didn't answer my question, so I started looking at the literature. Certainly I first looked at the internet, uh, all the things that are out there on the internet about life near wind turbines. Uh, I, sorry. I ended up writing or co-authoring uh, an article in the monthly journal Audiology Today summarizing our thoughts, that is mine and Rick James' thoughts, and a, uh, it was an engineer student of mine, a student of mine who was an engineering major who helped us with that particular article. I was... Uh, subsequently asked to chair sorry uh, subsequently asked to chair a meeting uh, of a group called the Wind and Health Technical Work Group to look at revising Michigan's uh, siting guidelines for onshore wind turbines. Uh, after that I was asked to uh, asked to come to a few public meetings and hearings of zoning boards and commissions in several states um, I co-authored an article, an invited article, turned out to be a three-part article on the subject matter. Uh, I, I was qualified in Michigan in what's called a Dobert hearing as a um, health expert. Uh, I want to talk about in a minute what's the difference between a health expert and a medical expert. There's a little bit of difference. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I served as a witness in several, uh, in several states, uh, either before or after wind turbines were constructed. Uh, I've interviewed um, 
the three families I've interviewed in three uh, separate states, uh, the interviews were based on an eight-page uh, long questionnaire about various as aspects of living near the turbines, including health effects. Uh, we've subsequently uh, interviewed more informally a number of other families who live near turbines. And finally, I don't think many of you can see that, but uh, co I co-authored an article with Rick James in 2016. We called it Wind Turbine Noise and Human Health, a four-decade history of evidence that wind turbines pose risks. Uh, what's the difference between uh, medical and health expert? Well, I like to differentiate it because I do not have a medical degree, okay? I'm not a medical doctor. I am a an audiologist, audiologist, audiology is a health-related profession, a healthcare profession, and if you want, an allied health profession. Uh, there's a difference between what's called specific causation and general causation. A phys I mean, a, a physician, a medical doctor, requires that a per a, the doctor look at an individual patient and diagnose the symptoms. For example, uh, abdominal pain might be caused by a gallbladder problem, a gallbladder attack. Uh, I think the minimum requirements for a medical uh, person who testifies in legal cases on the matter should have certainly the medical education, should make individual contact with patients or with uh, people who, are, who have complaints, and the knowledge of acoustics and its effects on people. And I find many of the uh, physicians who testify on behalf of the wind industry uh, do not have the latter. They don't, have a, they don't have much of an appreciation. Some do, but most don't, I don't think. Uh, a knowledge of acoustics and how it affects people. General causation is what I try to, uh, I, is the category I put myself in. It usually requires that a, a scientist or some other person determines what is causing the symptoms of people in a given population, such as cigarette smoking causes cancer. Uh, I think that person needs an education either in epidemiology or some other health-related profession, um, has a research background, it's very helpful to, particularly to be able to interpret research, uh, be able to conduct site visits of, of residents who live near turbines, do interviews with those people, and have a knowledge of acoustics, at least some knowledge of acoustics and its effects on people. You'll see these abbreviations throughout uh, a lot of my slides, adverse health effects, industrial wind turbines, which I'll usually call just wind turbines, uh, and the World Health Organization, the WHO or WHO. Uh, the, the World Health Organization uh, basically looks at annoyance and nuisance as the same thing, defining annoyance as any sound that is perceived as irritating or a nuisance. Uh, nuisance, by the way, is a a term that's usually used in some, it's used often rather in some state and local uh, regulations to control noise to be able to protect the use of, use of and enjoyment of private property. The uh, World Health Organization it defines health, and this has been true since 1942, I believe, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Uh, that definition would include annoyance, uh, I think, as a health effect. Oops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, not going to read these. These are references in that uh, 2016 article, if you want to refer to the uh, actual articles. Uh, there are a number of research studies that link annoyance and low-frequency noise. Low-frequency noise, when I use that term, it's an umbrella term for uh, frequencies uh, below about 200 hertz, below about 20 hertz, or cycles per second, we're talking about infrasound. Um, a, a, this graph compares annoyance, in fact, high annoyance, people, the percent of people who are highly annoyed to various kinds of noises. Uh, the three graphs here, I'll just think of, you think of this one as uh, air, aircraft noise, the middle curves as uh, traffic noise, and the lower part, lower curves, as rail noise, uh, whereas this would be wind turbine noise. You can see that for, for road traffic, uh, people are, 10% of people are highly annoyed at about 58 dB, dBA, and uh, 
Rob Brand will be talking more in depth about what DBA is in case you are not really familiar with that term. Um, whereas 10% 10, 10 of people are highly annoyed at a much lower level of just over 37, I believe, dB or so, um, much lower level, because wind turbine noise is kind of a unique noise. It has unique characteristics. Um, the, the Health Canada study, which in overall purports that there really are no adverse health effects from noise, really admits or says the people who did that study uh, say that extreme annoyance is an adverse health effect. Uh, anybody who's exposed to 35 to 40 dBA, uh, I should say it this way, 10% of the people who are exposed to, to 35 to 40 dBA are highly annoyed. And uh, about 14% of people who are exposed to levels of 40 to 46 dBA are highly annoyed. Leventhal, uh, who's a British acoustician, has said for many years that infrasound, since it's below the threshold of audibility, we really can't hear it, it can't hurt us. So what we can't hear cannot hurt us. Alex Salt, who is a... Uh, an internationally known researcher of the inner ear, says that this logic seems to apply only to hearing, since we know that things we can't taste, smell, uh, touch, or see can hurt us. And all of you can name substances that, where that, that, that fall into those categories. So why should hearing be any different? So you have to get, the, the idea here is, is that even though we cannot hear it as sound, infrasound can in fact be perceived, and we'll talk a little bit about what perception, perceptions are involved there. Uh, many of you have heard about the history of this. Uh, in, I think in about 2009, uh, Dr. Nina Pierpont, who is a pediatric neurologist from the state of New York, uh, has labeled these various symptoms wind turbine syndrome. Uh, I won't read them, but there are a variety of syndromes that people uh, in fact, do tend to uh, report on or, or complain about, including headaches, irritability, uh, dizziness, and so on. The biggest uh, complaint of most people, though, the biggest problem with wind turbine noise is sleep disturbance. Uh, wind turbines are fully operational more at nighttime than they are during the daytime. In fact, when we need the energy, they're not there to provide it. In a uh, controlled experiment in Australia with the cooperation of the wind company, which is rare, uh, an, uh, an Australian acoustician, Stephen Cooper, and his colleague have, have uh, done two experiments, one in the field, just people who are in homes uh, surrounded by turbines, and the other in a laboratory. And they've shown that uh, there are perceptions he calls, they call sensations only because uh, Steve Cooper is not a medical doctor, he didn't want to call it adverse health effects. Uh, these, and, and this was done, these studies were done blinded, visually blinded. The people didn't really know that uh, the wind turbines were operating at the times they wrote in their diaries their symptoms and so on. Uh, the sensations included pressure in the head, the ears, or the chest, kind of a vibratory sensation, if you will, uh, headaches, heart racing, uh, and, a, and a sensation of heaviness. So we know from these kinds of studies that alternative explanations for adverse health effects from wind turbine noise, uh, like the nocebo effect, in other words, psychological expectations, cannot account for uh, or cannot cause uh, adverse health effects or, or don't cause adverse health effects, but rather it is, in fact, the infrasound itself. Obviously, audible sound as well as infrasound can also cause adverse health effects, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. I looked uh, for other studies that uh, added to the symptoms that uh, Dr. Pierpont and uh, Steve Cooper reported, and uh, we have a list of things here. Reduced quality of life is on that list. High anxiety, uh, visual blurring, migraine headaches, changes in heart rate, and vomiting. And there's a really good study uh, in 2018 by uh, Mariana, Dr. Uh, Mariana Alves Pereira, uh, 
that explains some biological effects of uh, infrasound, especially if the, uh, if the exposure is high intensity and uh, is sustained over a period of time. Uh, look, let's look here at the relationships between noise and health. Uh, noise can directly cause health problems in, we have terms like burnout, sleepiness, depression on the, on the right side there. Uh, it can also cause noise annoyance, which can lead to health effects. Noise annoyance and uh, noise itself can lead to uh, high cortisol levels. Cortisol is a hormone that's highly associated with uh, anxiety and stress okay, and is physically measurable. Uh, the box at the top, effort reward imbalance, just is there to indicate that people's attitudes toward turbines can also uh, affect or either increase or, or reduce the health effects, avoid the health effects. Uh, people, for example, who hate the sight of wind turbines might say that I hate the sound as well. There's one study that I thought was intriguing that found in a control kind of experiment, which I thought was well done, says that if you, if you hate the sound, you, can also, you also learn to hate this, the sight of them. So it could work in reverse. As, as you move closer to wind turbines, they get bigger and they get noisier. It's kind of hard to separate out uh, what effect one thing has on the other. Uh, Paul Schulmer, who's the uh, uh, Emeritus Director of the Standards uh, uh, Division of the Acoustical Society of America, has come up with this little uh, graphic or explanation for uh, the, that explain audible sound effects and infrasound effects on health. Uh, audible sounds, things we can hear at night, uh, for example, or anytime, can cause annoyance and at night can cause sleep disturbance, but infrasound can also cause sleep disturbance and uh, adverse health effects. Uh, annoyance can, cause, can lead to sleep disturbance. If you're highly annoyed about something, you don't sleep as well, typically. As I get older, I find that's more of a problem. Uh, infras uh, I have a couple of uh, errors that, are, that say indirect, they're indirect effects also. So wind turbine noise, for example, can cause awakenings and uh, chronic awakenings can lead to adverse health effects. I've added a th a th another um, arrow over here to indicate that health effects, once they occur for whatever reason, can also lead to sleep disturbance. That's fairly obvious, I think. Another graph just saying these are studies uh, make the point that uh, sleep disturbance is the most well-documented uh, symptom of wind turbine noise in the literature. Again, you can refer to those studies if you want to read any of them. Uh, they're f the full references are in that 2016 article I mentioned. Uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, tells us that there are a number of things that uh, happen when we lose sleep. Uh, high blood pressure is one. Uh, we, we lose the ability to think properly, to recall, uh, and to learn. Uh, there's lowered immunity to disease. There can be weight gain in some people because of uh, prolonged sleep disturbance. There are negative effects on children's health and growth, particularly in children. It can also happen in terms of uh, tissue growth and muscle growth in adults as well. Uh, and there are even negative effects, this one surprised me a little bit, negative effects on puberty and fertility. So there are wide-ranging effects. I mentioned Dr. Salt earlier. He's a uh, neuroscientist uh, who studied the inner ear probably as much as anyone in the world, probably. Uh, the left-hand uh, graphic just shows a very microscopic view of the inner ear organic structure. Um, we have some, in, some outer hair cells and some inner hair cells, three rows of outer and one row of inner. It's really the inner hair cells that are responsible for taking sounds we hear and take, take, uh, transmit those impulses to the brain that, that we interpret as sound. They take it to the auditory centers of the brain. Uh, the, the outer hair cells work very differently. In this graph, a little harder to understand, I'll try to go through this uh, quickly, however. Uh, the sensitivity of the inner hair cells is this line. The outer hair cell sensitivity is this line. Anything above, this is wind turbine noise spectrum. So this is low to high frequency. 
And this is, of course, uh, soft sounds to very loud sounds. Anything above these lines can be heard. So the sounds over here are audible because of the, the inner ear, certainly inner, inner hair cells, excuse me, have the sensitivity to be able to pick those up. There's a transition period here, but the important thing is the outer hair cells are sensitive to infrasound. And they don't take the sound to the auditory centers of the brain. In other words, we don't hear infrasound. We don't perceive it as sound. But instead, we perceive it in very, uh, very many kinds of uh, negative perceptions, negative sensations like dizziness, uh, nausea, seasickness or motion sickness, uh, fear and alerting uh, responses, fight or flight responses, and so on. Um, so in many of his articles, uh, his articles, Alex Salt says, uh, what you can't hear can't affect you is an invalid uh, uh, conclusion. What we can hear, uh, what we, excuse me, what we can't hear can hurt us, in fact. Uh, this is a little oversimplified because the brain is very complex, but I've tried to make a little sense of it. Uh, motion sickness has gotten a lot of attention lately as a symptom of wind turbine noise exposure. Um, there's the cerebellum in the brain, sometimes called the little brain, right here, uh, receives signals from the vestibular or balanced part of the inner ear, which is this part, this little snail-shaped structure is called the cochlea. That's what's responsible for our hearing. Without it, we, 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 we're deaf. Without it, in both ears, it would be deaf. Um, the muscles send uh, uh, signals also to the cerebellum and other parts of the brain, including the midbrain, and, and the eyeballs, the eyes, the vision. So the combination of vision, hearing, I'm sorry, vision and balance, and muscle proprioception, it's called, uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about where we are in space. It tells us about uh, we're moving or not, we're still, and about our posture. Uh, an example of this is if you're on a ferry boat. How many of you have ridden a ferry boat? Okay. If you're looking down at your feet, it seems like based on your uh, muscles and particularly your eyes that you're not moving but your balance system in the inner ear is being vibrated by the uh, movement of the boat. It, it rocks with the movement of the boat. And so when the senses of balance, vision, and muscle receptors receive conflicting information, you get motion sickness. There are lots of other examples. That's one I like, I think, the best. Uh, and infrasound from wind turbines are known to... I can't say we're, we know it's true, but it, it makes every bit of sense to think that it's possible. Uh, when, when, when we move, or when our inner ear moves, uh, fluids in this part of the inner ear move and uh, are responding to uh, movement up or down, uh, rotation and those kinds of things. And so uh, this movement caused by infrasound, we think, is what's causing motion sickness in people who are exposed to uh, wind turbines. Uh, most of the reported symptoms I've talked about have been uh, seen at distances that are far greater than those that are commonly used as setback distances for wind turbines. Uh, I've said this for a long time since we wrote our first little article on this. Uh, setbacks that are intended to protect physical safety, such as blade throw and ice throw and blade failure and all those things, are simply not sufficient to protect people from health issues, negative health issues. Uh, there are a number, and I'll just mention a few of these, there are a number of regulations. Uh, unfortunately, our EPA has not kept up with the times and, is, as far as I know, has not updated its uh, 1970s uh, regulations on noise control. I put this up here uh, only because, at least to point out that at least uh, these uh, particular acts of the EPA uh, do link noise to stress-related illnesses and other adverse health effects. Uh, Rob Rand will mention later some of the ANSI standards, I think. Uh, ANSI standards in general, I think it's safe to say that uh, they recommend uh, 
15 dB penalty or some extra penalty for new noise sources in quiet rural communities. Uh, the, a group called NARUC and the New York Department of Environmental Conservation recommend uh, uh, allowing up to uh, 5 or 6 dB above background levels because it's really what you're used to. If you live in New York City, you're used to 55 dB or 60 dB at any, almost any time of day and night, uh, at least periodically. But if you live in a rural countryside, you know, you're used to levels below 30 dB, probably, 30 dBA. Um, most of the turbines uh, produce, uh, that is, most background rule levels are less than 30 so at night. So uh, nighttime noise uh, often exceeds those guidelines uh, in, in turbine uh, projects that are approved. Uh, I'll talk on a separate slide about three different WHO guidelines. They do, uh, the purpose of those guidelines is to limit noise levels uh, to keep, to restrict annoyance or to minimize annoyance and adverse health effects. That's the whole purpose. Uh, Paul Schulmer and his colleague have recommended uh, levels of 36 to 38 dBA measured over a 24-hour period, which is quite doable in terms of practicality. Uh, as a basis for limiting uh, annoyance and adverse health effects. Uh, just in, in terms of history, uh, the 1999 WHO standard or, or guidelines uh, say that we should, outdoor noise should not exceed 45 dBA LEQ, uh, equal, uh, average level, and single noise events shouldn't exceed more than uh, 45, shouldn't go over 45 dBA, what's called LA max. Max is, a, is a, like a peak level or the maximum level as opposed to an average level over time. We don't listen to maximum, I'm sorry, we don't listen to average levels, we listen to what's currently present. And it's those bumps in the night that wake us up. Uh, it says special attention should be given to background noise when background noise is low, uh, when there are vibrations present, and when noise consists of low frequency uh, components. The 2019 uh, WHO uh, recommends 40 dB outside uh, at night and says we should limit the, LA, the maximum levels to 35 to 42 dB, but that's based on transportation noises and we probably should be even using lower levels for wind turbine noise. The 2018, uh, last year they came out with a new guideline, limits noise levels to 45 dB, what's called LDN, day, evening, and night levels, which equates to roughly 38 dB LEQ. So actually it's a lower limit than the 2009 uh, uh, guidelines proposed. And this guideline does not uh, include an LA Max uh, recommendation. Uh, the middle part of this slide is the most important part. Between uh, 30 and 40 dBA, the WHO says that sleep is affected. It can be arousals, awakenings, um, but the, the people who are most affected, are the vulnerable people, are young children, older adults, and people with chronic health conditions. So a person with vertigo, for example, spinning, the room spinning or you're spinning, uh, who's prone to motion sickness, and people like my own wife, my wife, I shouldn't say my own wife, uh, my wife, who is very noise sensitive, has never liked the stereo I set up in the uh, basement, the stereo system or the uh, 5.1, whatever, uh, home theater, because she can't stand the low frequencies. And uh, we've stopped going to the movies for the last 20 years, probably we've not been to a movie because she does not like the, the, hard, the hard low frequency stuff. This is quick. Uh, I mentioned a long questionnaire that uh, Rick, James, and I developed a few years ago. I used this questionnaire uh, eight-page questionnaire which contained an, an, at the beginning a number of health effects or potential health effects. We, didn't, we did not target the wind turbine syndrome effects. We, we had about 70 different potential health effects on the list and we asked the people either through the mail or per, in person what symptoms do you uh, experience? And in a family in, I'll call state A, another state, a mother, a father, and a son, I think he was about 13, had this many of these symptoms, which I thought was very telling, because 
we normally won't expect in a syndrome everybody to have all the, all the complaints or all the uh, issues, but this was a large number of those issues. Uh, this family had just added to their home uh, and uh, had just b built a big A-frame uh, view of the field and uh, the nice the scenery nearby, and then they put in the wind turbines. So they were debating whether or not they really wanted to live in that home. A family, actually it's an individual, I think my, uh, I have an extra in case this happened. Oops. I think of, yeah, this, this is an adult male in another state. He had about uh, seven of the ten symptoms that uh, uh, Pierpont mentions as wind turbine syndrome. Oh. And uh, this is too much to read. Let me just highlight some things that were given to me in a, from the interview uh, questionnaire that we made out. Uh, this was through the mail. Uh, a, a farm family, uh, they said they knew about the effects. They'd heard about the effects, but they didn't realize they, could be, so, they could be so bad. The relationships in the family have suffered. They're having to move from the family farm. I like this quote uh, from her husband. My wife told me she would rather have a hog building hooked to the house than have a wind turbine close to it. Uh, including the doctor, everybody told me I probably should move. And, and that's really the only thing a doctor can do, typically, uh, if it is, in fact, if health issues are caused by wind turbines, uh, wind turbine noise, uh, move away. Because when people move, uh, they know if they take a vacation, they live away from it for a, a, a week or, or a few days sometimes, uh, the symptoms subside or go away. And when they return, the symptoms come back. It's kind of a good experiment. Off and on. It's an off and on effect. So you're pretty, we're pretty sure it's, it is, in fact, the wind turbine noise. I know my time is, is much exceeded by this point, so I'm going to move to the conclusions. If I can advance my slides. Um, wind turbine noise is affected by a number of factors, including, uh, I won't read that list. You can read it. Uh, the only thing that we really can do, though, is... is move them away from people or keep them away from people as, as far as we can. Um, in, you should know that infrasound and low frequency noise are typically not masked by wind noise or other noises and can't or cannot be controlled effectively, effectively by barriers. Uh, I've known people to uh, put mattresses on the walls in their basement, uh, move to another room where the windows, away from the windows or whatever, and none of this helps. Wearing earplugs typically does not help people. Uh, it's because of the long wavelengths of infrasound, which I can't really get into at this point. Um, maybe I should move on to this one. Uh, in terms of setback distances, anything from a half mile to two and a half miles has been recommended. Uh, 1.25 miles, which is two kilometers, has been the, most, uh, uh, the distance most often recommended. But some others are now recommending longer distances, uh, some other uh, authorities. Uh, noise levels uh, recommendations include uh, those ranging from about 30 to 40 dBA. Um, some local zoning boards require that noise levels be limited to 5 to 10 dB above the prevailing background noise levels. And that's a pretty good criterion, I think, from my point of view. Uh, let, let it not go much above what's, uh, what the background noise levels are. Uh, a cardiologist in, in uh, Iowa largely, I think, is responsible for the Madison County Board of Health making the determination that the board encourage those entities with jurisdictions within the county to require a one-and-a-half-mile setback for future wind turbine projects. It's based on his experience with patients and uh, pa interviews and examinations of patients. Um, we are at the conclusions here. At one, I have one slide uh, after this, I think. Uh, annoyance can lead to stress, which can impact health. Uh, there are many adverse health conditions that are associated with uh, either directly or indirectly to audible and inaudible wind turbine noise, sleep disturbance being the most common complaint. Uh, Noise limits that the industry recommends are harmful, we believe, to the health of a substantial percentage of people. 
I'm not saying, and others aren't saying, that everybody who lives near a wind turbine are going to get sick. We're not saying that. We're saying a substantial or what's called a non-trivial percentage of people will complain of health effects. Uh, 1.25 miles, as I mentioned, just mentioned, has been recommended most often, and others are now saying it needs to be longer. Uh, 30 to, 38 to 40 se DBA seems like a reasonable uh, limit. Uh, that would be that's supported by the WHO guidelines and uh, Dr. Schomer. Uh, nighttime noise can probably be best contained or limited by using LA Max as a metric, as a measurement procedure, as opposed to average levels. Um, in, our, in our 2016 article, if I can advance. Oops. We said these things. Uh, if you will allow me, uh, I will read you this just to underline the fact that uh, Rick James and I, I think I can speak for Rick here, uh, we still believe these, these to be the case, these, these statements. Uh, we think the available literature, which includes research reported by scientists and other reputable professionals in many sources, including peer-reviewed uh, articles in the literature, uh, professional papers presented at uh, society meetings, uh, print and web-based media and government documents, all that, that all is sufficient to establish a general causal link between a variety of commonly observed adverse health effects and noise that are, is emitted by uh, wind turbines. We, instead of thinking about, are you pro-health? I mean, I'm sorry, are you are you pro-wind? Are you anti-wind? We like to think of it as we're pro-health. Our view is that there's enough anecdotal and scientific evidence to indicate that infrasound and low frequency noise from wind turbines causes annoyance, sleep disturbance, stress, and a number of other adverse health conditions to warrant siting the turbines at distances that are sufficient to avoid the harmful effects, uh, which without being sited properly occur in a substantial percentage of the population. Uh, I'm uh, available most times uh, outside this meeting uh, or inside after the, the meeting. Uh, to answer any questions, my contact information is here. If you ever want to look at this article, if you haven't seen it, uh, much of this, the things I've said today uh, do come from our discussion of these issues in that fairly long article. Thank you very much.